Deirdre was having just a lovely day. It was a summer's day. She had sat up last night writing letters to her friends and she walked into Newbridge Town to post them. Deirdre had called into her grandmother who owned a little shop right in the town and who was really important to Deirdre. She had been there just briefly because she had stuff to do. So while Deirdre was going to post the letters which she had written to her friends, she could also post a bank draft in the post office which was to secure a deposit on next year's accommodation in college. She just had to run into the bank first to order one. They told her she'd have to come back in in a little while. So that's when she went to her grandmother for a short while, then returned to the bank where she collected the bank draft onto the post office and we've got CCTV footage for all this where she posted the letters and the bank draft to the UK for the following year. She had always wanted either to be a teacher or a writer. She chose teacher and she already had her first year completed of history and English studies. So having posted the letters to her friends and posted the deposit to secure next year's rent in London, Deirdre made her way back home. She had grown up here, so she knew this place like the back of her hand And everyone knew her, or most people. As she made her way through the town, along the road to her house, she was meeting and greeting people the whole way. Eight different people saw her make this journey at different stages, six of whom knew her really well, and two who just identified her later from posters. She was a fast walker. It would have taken her approximately 20 to 25 minutes to get home. One of her neighbours, who was working on his roof, saw her shouting hello as she was getting close to her house. And then a passenger in a car spotted her on the grass verge right outside her house, which was situated just back in off the road. This was around three o'clock in the afternoon. Deirdre's mother, Bernadette, finished her day's work in the HSE a couple of hours later and made her way home around 5pm, knowing Deirdre was going to be there. Bernadette's other daughter, Deirdre's little sister Kira, four years younger than her, was staying in a friend's house. Bernadette arrives home. She reaches the front door and finds it locked. Now this is immediately concerning to Bernadette. She always knows where Deirdre is. So she opens the door with the key and she's greeted with silence. Deirdre is not there. Not only that, but there's no sign of her, her bag, her large black bag that you couldn't mistake. Nothing to show Deirdre had returned to the house at all. Bernadette would always know, always, where Deirdre was. When Bernadette's husband, Michael, gets home from work, she tells him, Deirdre is not here and I haven't heard from her. That immediately raises his concerns. That very evening, huge searches would take place by law enforcement for Deirdre, who had vanished between the grass verge and her front door. My name is Louise. This is a drop in the ocean and let's dive in. Deirdre Jacobs' case is the most bizarre from all of the cases in the so-called Vanishing Triangle. It could have been and probably was the case that actually led the media to coming up with the title Ireland's Vanishing Triangle because Deirdre Jacob really did seem to vanish into thin air. Not dissimilar to Jojo Dullard, except that Deirdre was at her home, in front of her home. There has been so much speculation regarding a serial killer when it comes to Ireland's Vanishing Triangle. As we've seen so far in this series, and we'll revisit this later, most of these unfortunate victims disappeared at the hands of someone known very well to them. But it's difficult to hear about Deirdre's case and not speculate about a serial killer, especially when you hear of the finer details. Deirdre may very well have fallen victim to one of Ireland's very well-known monsters. We'll get into that. But to get a good idea of the circumstances surrounding Deirdre's case and to see how and why Deirdre Jacob still has not been found, let's discuss everything we know. So Deirdre Jacob was the eldest of two to parents Michael and Bernadette, or Barney. Deirdre was born and raised in Newbridge, just outside the town in a place called Rosebury, one and a half kilometres from Newbridge Town Centre. She had a happy childhood, raised in a loving, safe, happy environment. She sounds like one of those children who just 
does everything right. She was excellent in school. She was very social, getting along with everyone. And she was very talented artistically. Deirdre played the clarinet, the piano, the guitar. She was also passionate about drama and writing and sports. It just sounds like there was nothing Deirdre couldn't do if she put her mind to it. So by 1998, at 18 years old, Deirdre Jacob had already spent a year as a trainee teacher in London, studying history and English in St. Mary's University College with plans to go on to be a primary school teacher. Remember I said in the beginning, the day she disappeared, she had been posting letters to her friends. This is something Deirdre loved to do. She loved to write. While studying in London, she would regularly write home to both her parents and her little sister. Deirdre had a boyfriend in London who was supposed to be coming to meet her family shortly. But that wasn't to be. Deirdre had loved her first year in college and was looking forward to going back in the autumn for her second year. While on her break between her first and her second year, she had returned to complete a work placement in the very primary school she had attended as a pupil herself. And thanks to her mother, she was just about to begin to start a part-time job in the HSE, which would commence the following month, August. But on this day, July 28, 1998, while Deirdre had walked into town to secure her deposit on her accommodation, she was captured on CCTV in many places in or outside six different establishments. So it was easy to confirm a definite timeline leading up to Deirdre's disappearance. Then, along her walk home, there were eight sightings, six of whom knew Deirdre really well and two because of the distinctive shoulder bag Deirdre had with her. This was a large black caterpillar bag with the very well-known fluorescent yellow C-A-T letters on it. This bag has never been found. The letters Deirdre posted that day, along with the bank draft she sent to England, they were all received. The last time Deirdre was seen was on the grass verge right outside her home. Deirdre never made it through this front door as if she had. The door would have been unlocked. Extensive searches were carried out, both land and water. There was a reenactment organised. People interviewed. Many lines of inquiry were followed chasing leads but law enforcement did everything they possibly could to try solve this case within a few hours of Deirdre going missing. The media were also going crazy with this case. The very spot Deirdre went missing from is a mere 29.5 kilometres from where Jojo Dullard was last known to be in the phone box in Moon County Kildare. This is what I believe began the whole concept of Ireland's vanishing triangle. Deirdre and Jojo were then in such close proximity to each other when last sighted, just two years apart and both vanishing without a trace. The January following Deirdre's disappearance, Deirdre's mother Bernadette would receive a letter in the post. This letter was four pages long. It was not signed, it was anonymous, but the writer does say he's in Fermanagh, up north of Ireland. This man had made 10 anonymous phone calls already regarding Deirdre's case. He said in this letter that he gave Deirdre a lift. He says she was irritated that he drove her up north. Public appeals were made for this man to come forward, but he didn't. So a recording of one of his phone calls was made public. Just some of it. And within a few hours, law enforcement had him identified. Unfortunately, this man was found to be suffering from serious mental health issues and had become fixated on Deirdre's case and had just inserted himself into it. We hear this happening sometimes. It was a hoax. This caused outrage with the public. Law enforcement had wasted so many resources trying to identify this man and following his false leads. And Deirdre's family, they had been given this glimmer of hope And it was just wiped out. They were devastated. They had for a second believed that their daughter, their sister, was alive. Deirdre's case would go cold. So what happened? Well, 
As there has been no trace of Deirdre Jacob or Jojo Dollard, they had no abusive partners, no ex-partners that were abusive or anyone else suspicious in either of their lives. So we are only left with speculation and theories because no one has ever been held accountable. But for a number of reasons, one of those theories seems to be a lot more credible than the others. So let's look at the theories. The first theory is that possibly due to family problems or simply because of Deirdre's age being a teenager that she chose to disappear. But there are really no grounds whatsoever for this theory. Deirdre was doing exactly as she wanted to do. She was extremely close to her family. She had her Irish group of friends here at home and she had formed a group of friends in college in London. She had been living in student accommodation for her first year in London, but the deposit she had just posted was for separate accommodation. So she was moving out from the college. This was going to be a brand new experience. She had been planning ahead and had everything organised. There was nothing for Deirdre to run away from or to. Another theory is that someone may have been stalking Deirdre, become familiar with her routine and pounced when they knew the opportunity was there. But this was not Deirdre's routine. The previous weekend, Deirdre had been away with her friends, up north actually, for the weekend. She was home from college. She had gone to town on this day the day she disappeared, primarily to pay next year's deposit, which wasn't routine. And nothing at all had happened in the days, weeks prior to point towards a stalker. Nothing unusual had occurred. However, we'll revisit this theory for reasons that will become obvious to you in the final episode. The next theory, had someone followed Deirdre home from town? But if someone had followed her on foot... Her neighbours would have seen this person just as they saw Deirdre. The person following her would have had to have been pretty close to Deirdre as Deirdre made it to her front gate but not to her front door. The same goes for anyone who may have been following Deirdre in a car. How would they have followed her going at a snail's pace and not have her neighbour see them or her noticed them, or any other motorists noticed them. And there would have been and were other motorists. Because remember, she was spotted by a passenger right outside her gate. In this vehicle was a father and daughter, and it was the daughter who who noticed Deirdre and recognised the large CAT bag she was carrying. Here in Ireland, when Deirdre Jacob disappeared, there were no suspects, No abusive exes, no people who were holding grudges or might have anything against Deirdre that may have wanted to cause her harm. There were just no leads. Everyone was baffled. As you know, the review had taken place in relation to the murder of Deirdre Jacob and that review commenced uh, three years ago. As part of that review and a review of the evidence in the file, the woodland we're at here today was identified as an area of interest that may be relevant to the investigation. For that purpose today we've commenced a search of that woodland on foot of a a search warrant that we've obtained from the District Court. All I'll say is, as part of the review, there was unusual activity noticed at the woodland in or around the time Deirdre went missing. When we reviewed it we felt this was relevant and it was more relevant than maybe initially thought. And based on that we felt felt it prudent to commence a, a thorough search of the area here. Searches continued, but no body would be found. Deirdre's case, for a number of reasons, is intertwined with the case of Larry Murphy, also known as the Beast of Bolton Glass. Larry Murphy did become intertwined in Deirdre's case. He was a suspect, and for good reason, which we'll get into. He was also linked, but never convicted, to at least one of the other missing women included in the Vanishing Triangle. He has not been ruled out. That's all I will say about Larry Murphy until we get to the episode where we'll dive right into it. And I'll already issue a content warning for an episode as the details describing what Larry Murphy did and was convicted of are both disturbing and truly disgusting. But more about that later. In 2018, this case was upgraded to a murder investigation. Um, Michael uh, Bernie, can I first ask you, I suppose, your reaction to the fact now that the investigation has been upgraded to a murder? What was your initial thoughts are when you were told that by Gardaí? 
Well, uh, we obviously when 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 you hear those those, those words uh, and it's upgraded to murder, uh, that is it's it's a uh, even though we know it is coming along, uh, it's still a shock when you hear those cold words, uh, and uh, it, it, it's a real heart wrencher. And uh, you know when we heard it on, on the on the radio this morning, you know it, it, we were literally stunned by it. You know it's 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 a it's a big shock. It's a big shock. And yourself, Bernie? Well, of course I feel the same as Michael and no one wants to hear that their child has been murdered and it's very difficult to take it. Does it give you any sense of closure at all that, you know, that, that I suppose that chapter of this investigation has now closed? Um, well, it, the investigation is still, is still on. Can you tell us a little bit about Deirdre, the type of person she was? Well, she was a very, uh, a very happy-go-lucky uh, girl. Uh, she uh, was uh, 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 had a great circle of friends. Uh, she and, and kept in very, very close contact with them. Um, her interests were. Uh, maybe Barry, you can fill her better on the on the various interests that she had. Well, she played the piano and the guitar, and. Um, she liked socialising with her friends and she was a reader and she was big into letter writing. Now she didn't have a mobile phone because it was only at early stages that the mobile phones becoming so popular. So she would be big into letter writing and we would, when she was at college in Twickenham in London, we would regularly get letters and we would write and even the evening before she went missing, when we went in to say goodnight to her, she was she was writing a letter yes yeah, she was writing, writing letters to to uh, to her friends although it was really difficult for Deirdre's family to hear that this was upgraded to a murder investigation it is a good thing for a missing person because reclassifying a case or upgrading it to a murder inquiry it brings about more robust techniques which can be used it means law enforcement can get warrants to search and it facilitates the arrest and detention of people of interest. The last thing I will leave you with in Deirdre Jacobs case is potentially the last eyewitness who came forward. This was a man driving along the road where Deirdre lived the same time as Deirdre disappeared. This man was in a Jeep, so he had an elevated view. When the driver came forward, he said that he saw a car with a driver passenger. The passenger was either laughing or crying. Now remember this as it's extremely important. It's been a very empty time without Deirdre in, in our lives. There's reminders every day since over the 25 years uh, that, that she's not around. Whenever you look at photographs that have been taken over 25 years, there's, there's that empty space. Dear, uh, dear, dear is not there. Deirdre Jacob was last seen on the 28th of July, 1998, near her home at Rosebury, Newbridge, County Kildare, at approximately 3 p.m. Deirdre was 18 years old in 1998. She would be 43 years old this year. She was a young woman starting off her life who had just completed one year at St. Mary's University, Twickenham, London. She was training to be a primary school teacher in the UK. She just had completed the one year and um, she had come home earlier that year to do some training in the local primary school that she had attended herself. Deirdre had enjoyed her life in London and was looking forward to returning to college that September. On the 28th of July 1998, Deirdre had walked into Newbridge Town to get a bank draft to send to a college friend in London for their rent deposit. At 2.14pm, Deirdre is observed on CCTV walking on Main Street, Newbridge, at approximately 2.18pm, Deirdre is then observed in the EIB bank getting £100 bank draft and leaves the bank a short time later. At 2.26pm, Deirdre is observed again on CCTV queuing in the post office, Newbridge. At 2.32pm, CCTV is recorded walking outside PTSB Bank on Main Street, Newbridge. 
Deirdre was last seen shortly after 3 p.m. near her family home outside Newbridge. Deirdre was 5 foot 3 inches in height, slim build, with grey green eyes and dark chin length hair. When she went missing, Deirdre was wearing a navy V neck t shirt with white trim on collar and sleeves, navy or black straight jeans, and blue nightcrawlers. Deirdre was carrying a distinctive black satchel type bag with long shoulder strap and word cat in large yellow capital letters on the side. The black satchel bag has never been located. There has been a 25 year investigation into Deirdre's disappearance during which significant inquiries have been carried out to establish her whereabouts and to investigate the circumstances in which she disappeared. On the 20th anniversary of her disappearance, Angarda Shikana confirmed that the missing person investigation had been upgraded to a murder investigation. Today, the 25th anniversary of Deirdre's disappearance and murder, I appeal to any person with any information in relation to the murder of Deirdre Jacob to contact the Garda investigation team. I want to speak to any person who met, spoke with, or had any interaction with Deirdre Jacob on the 28th of July, 1998 or subsequent. There are person or persons who have information on the disappearance of Deirdre Jacob and her murder on or about the 28th of July, 1998, and who haven't yet spoken to Gardaí, or who may have already spoken to Gardaí, but were not in a position to tell everything that they know at that time. Do you recognise yourself in the queue in the post office, or do you recognise any of the persons in the queue? I want to speak to every person that was in that queue. I want to speak with any person who has any information on the black satchel type bag with long shoulder straps and the word cat in large yellow capital letters on the side which Deirdre was in possession of when she went missing. I'm appealing to those persons 25 years later to please come forward and speak to the investigation team. The primary focus of this investigation is the victim, Deirdre Jacob and her family. Deirdre's parents, Michael and Bernadette, deserve to know the truth. Michael and Bernadette deserve to know what happened to their daughter. The, the search for Deirdre has taken over pretty much, uh, you know, because we, we're so anxious to try and find, uh, find out, first of all, what happened to Deirdre, uh, and also, where is she? So, from that end, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's part of our everyday life. I would say that it's a long 25 years and we would appeal to anybody that at the time, 25 years ago, did you hear anything? Did you hear anything in the meantime or overhear anybody speaking? Um, is there anything at all that uh, could help us with our search for Deirdre? Again, I would urge any person or persons with information in relation to the murder of Deirdre Jacob please come forward to either the investigation team at Kildare Garda Station at 45 221 the Garda Confidential Line at 1-800-666-111, Crime Stoppers at 1-800-250-025 or any Garda Station. I would appeal to any person who have information about Deirdre's murder not to assume we know and are that it has limited value. Let us make that decision. The Garda are, are waiting for, for that piece of information to come and now might be the right time uh, to uh, come forward with that information. No matter how small you might think it, be, it, it might be, it may be the piece of information that will make the difference and, and solve Deirdre's case. And that concludes today's case. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching. I appreciate it so much. I'll see you shortly for the last episode of Ireland's Vanishing Triangle. We will then have a concluding episode where I delve into the beast from Bolton Glass, Larry Murphy. Take care of yourselves and each other. Good luck. <laughs>